Welcome, everybody. I want to thank everybody for showing up for tonight's events and some free lecture series uh, on the trail of the Jack Jackalope with Michael Branch. Uh, as I said before, we do have these books for sale in the gift shop if you'd like to purchase one. And then Mike will be doing some question and answer signing books later on. Um, I want to remind you our next Francis Humphrey lecture series uh, will be November 17th, and that will be uh, Ken Eaton and Ron Ransom, Steve Ransom, I'm sorry, uh, talking about their, uh, their book, uh, Nevada Goes to War. Um, that will be November 17th. It's a week earlier than, than normal. This was a week later. I'm glad you all picked up on that and were able to make it. And that will be a week earlier in November due to Thanksgiving. And then we will take December off and start again in January uh, with our lectures. Okay, so without further ado, here he is, Michael Rich. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to be using my teacher voice, but if anybody in the back can't hear me, just start waving, okay? A little bit louder? Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you for supporting the public events programming here at the museum. I have been all over the West since March when this book came out, and it's really fun to be back in Nevada again, and my wife is with me, which is a treat. I don't get to have her with me very often. So I just got back from doing some book events in New Mexico, and I'll be here for a couple of days, and then I'm doing a whole bunch in Utah, and I've just been, I think, in every state in the Intermountain West since March. But um, I live in Reno, and I teach at UNR, and so for me, being able to do events here on my home turf is really, really fun for me. So thanks to everybody for coming out. And I wanted to mention while I'm thinking about it, today we're going to be talking about uh, this new book, On the Trail of the Jackalope. It's very much about the American West, but it's not Nevada specific. But my last three books are all Nevada specific. In fact, I refer to them as the Nevada Trilogy. That's Raising Wild, Rants from the Hill, and How to Cuss in Western. <laughs> and all three of those are humor books, and they're all about the high desert, and they're about my wife and I uh, raising our girls out in a remote part of the Great Basin Desert. Uh, and so there's a lot of natural history, there's a lot of Nevada specific stuff, and there's a lot of humor. And I wanted to mention that um, this book is out, the new book is out in audiobook, but on the strength of this book, we have been able to uh, do audiobooks of all three of the Nevada books, and they've all come out just in the last month or two. So for those of you who prefer to listen instead of read, all four of these books are available as audiobooks. So it's great to be with you guys. I'm going to spend a little less than an hour giving you a crash course in jackalopes, and then I will be happy to answer any questions or to inscribe and sign books or just hang out and talk with you a little bit uh, as well. So uh, thanks so much uh, to Kelly for making me welcome and to you guys for coming out. Before I get started, can everybody picture a jackalope? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is amazing when you go to other parts of the country. Kelly, help me out on this. Uh, should I turn it back on? Maybe so. That's as well. Of course, the battery goes. While Kelly is working on <laughs> <laughs> while Kelly is working on that, I'll just make a couple comments about how I got interested in this particular topic. I write a lot about the American West. I do a lot of humor writing, and I also do a lot of popular science writing, where I'm sort of introducing people to animals and to scientific topics, but trying to do it in a way that's funny and engaging and accessible. So for me, the jackalope really felt like it was kind of at the crossroads of these different interests. And uh, so that was the background. But what really got me um, chasing this topic is that I just started to see jackalopes everywhere, especially in the last five years or so. I mean, t-shirts and bumper stickers and beers and whiskeys and the name of teams and bands. And suddenly it just seemed like the jackalope was everywhere. And then I was at Great Basin Brewery up in Reno thinking about this one day. And I saw a woman lift a pint of beer and I looked at her shoulder and she had a jackalope tattoo. <laughs> and I said, this has gone far enough. I've got to figure out, first of all, where this thing came from. That was my original motivation was to figure out what is the origin story of, the, of this imaginary animal. And then secondly, how did it get so widely disseminated in the culture? Why is it that we see it everywhere? 
And I'm kind of a nerd for the history of the American West. And I knew that in the 19th century, storytellers invented lots and lots of animals and would use them in their storytelling. And so American folklore is full of invented animals. And yet most of those, if I were to ask you about a dungaree or a side hill gouger, we don't even remember the names of these animals. And yet the jackalope has had this staying power for almost a hundred years. So um, hopefully we'll get our images going and I can share those with you as well. But I want to start out by just telling you what I did first as part of this journey that took me all over the West. I interviewed all kinds of people to hear their stories about jackalopes and to understand more about this. Um, so in the beginning of the book, I launch into the origin story. Where did the jackalope come from? Well, it turns out that back in the 1930s, two enterprising teenagers who lived in a little town called Douglas, Wyoming, out on the edge of the prairie, had been taking a mail order taxidermy class. Now, back in the day, before we did online stuff, people did mail order classes where every week they would send you through the post mail another lesson in whatever it was you were learning to do. And these kids were had taken up taxidermy as a hobby, which actually was really popular in the United States in the 1930s and 40s. In fact, back in the day, the Boy Scouts had a merit badge for taxidermy. They have it in decades, but they did back then. It was a really common pastime. So these two boys had been doing this mail order correspondence course on taxidermy, and they had been out one day hunting, as many people did during the 1930s, to augment the family dinner. And they bagged a jackrabbit. And the way they told the story later was that they came home, they had that jackrabbit, they threw it on the floor of their shop, it slid up against a pair of deer antlers that had been there from when they dressed out a deer a few days before. And one of the boys said, let's mount that thing. They had the idea instantly that they would try their rudimentary taxidermy skills and they would put together these antlers and this jackrabbit and they would just invent something silly and strange. Well, they did create that first jackalope hoax mount and they sold it for 10 bucks, which would have been a princely sum for a teenager in the 1930s. They sold it for 10 bucks to the guy who owned the local hotel in Douglas, and he hung that up over the bar in his hotel, where it hung from the 1930s through the 1970s. Every jackalope you have ever seen, every taxidermy mount, every shot glass and oven mitt and snow globe, every bumper sticker and t-shirt came from that first jackalope that those two boys created on their own, from their own imaginations, thank you, you bet. in Douglas, Wyoming, back in the 1930s. So um, this is an old jackalope postcard. We're gonna come back to postcards in a minute. And this mount on the left is probably more or less what you picture when you think of a jackalope. Now this is Douglas, Wyoming, which I mentioned. This is sort of what it would have looked like at about the time the jackalope was invented in the 1930s. And this is the old Labonte Hotel, where I mentioned that that first jackalope taxidermy Mount Hunt. So I jumped in my pickup here in Reno. I drove a thousand miles to Douglas. I checked into the Labonte Hotel and I started talking to everybody who would talk to me about jackalopes. Everybody from hunters and ranchers to oil patch roughnecks to all the way up to the people who run the local museum and even the mayor of the town. Now, part of what's fascinating about Douglas, Wyoming is to this day, they are all in on jackalopes. <laughs> every team name at the schools, every, I mean, you know, the, the burger you get at the local burger joint, everything is named after jackalopes. Here is the jackalope statue that is outside their visitor center and just a picture I took of its shadow. And I'll tell you in a minute why this visitor center becomes important to the story. Uh, I... This is my 10th book, but it was my first book using a lot of interviews. And like a lot of writers, I just sort of like to do research and you know focus on what I'm focusing on. But it turned out to be so fun to talk with and meet so many different people from around the country and to get their take on jackalopes. So in Douglas, as I mentioned, I interviewed lots and lots of folks there. But my favorite interview of that stop was my very last one. And um, by the way, I'm gonna show you a lot of images tonight and sort of talk you through the project. I'm only gonna read a few snippets just to give you a feel for the prose and how the storytelling works in the book. I don't wanna read at you for the whole time, but I am gonna drop into just a couple of selected readings 
to sort of give you a feel for uh, how much fun the project was. So part of what's been great about this is everywhere I go around the country, around the West mainly, of course, not only am I asking people about jackalopes, they're telling me their jackalope stories, right? And in Douglas, everybody has a jackalope story. And in fact, the way the mayor put it to me was he said, we're a town with an inside joke. We're all in on it. But people from outside our town often are not. And so in Douglas, they not only celebrate that they are the home of the jackalope, they're still using these jackalope stories to have fun with people after all these years. So for example, the mayor told me, oh yeah, I go to these mayor's conferences in Washington, D.C., I just hand out postcards of jackalopes and I invite all the other mayors to come jackalope hunting with me in Wyoming. <laughs> and I said, do they fall for, fall for that, really? And he said, it's DC, they don't know anything about Wyoming. <laughs> and that's part of the fun of this kind of storytelling, right? Is that it has always been used by storytellers in the West to sort of make fun of the elite Eastern establishment, the people who think they know so much more than we do, well, if you know so much, how come you fell for this, right? <laughs> so one of the most fun people I spoke with is the woman who runs the visitor center in Douglas. And so I want to just share with you a little snippet of my account at the end of the first chapter of the book of what it was like to talk with her. My final stop is the town's visitor center, which is set up in a charming old train depot near the North Platte River, a broad, shallow, gleaming beauty that meanders languidly through town and beneath Jackalope Bridge. Told you everything in town, right? <laughs> Everyone I've talked to in preparation for this pilgrimage has recommended that I meet with the Jackalope Lady, Helga Bull. Helga is expecting me and lights up as I enter the old building. The Jackalope Lady is pure of warmth, energy, and enthusiasm. And before I can ask my first question, she launches into what I can tell is her routine but it's such an enjoyable one that I have no urge to preempt it. Here's what you came for, Mike, Bull exclaims, gesturing toward a wall featuring three jackalope shoulder mounts with a fourth full body mount displayed on a table below. The wall also features a bright yellow jackalope crossing sign, an original of the horned rabbit medallion that decorates the nearby bridge over the North Platte, and a large framed replica of Wyoming Governor Ed Hirschler's proclamation officially designating Douglas the home of the jackalope. <laughs> now, there are two species of jackalope. These here with the branching antlers, that's the mountain species. But sometimes you see the plain species has horns like an antelope. Of course, those are all bucks. Doe jackalopes don't have horns or antlers. <laughs> Both the mountain and plain species are related to a much larger species called the saber-toothed jackalope. <laughs> that one's probably extinct now. Those ones weighed up to 150 pounds. Bones of that big fella have been found all over Converse County. As Helga continues her jackalope primer, I noticed that one of the creatures on display is wearing a blue bandana tied loosely around its neck. Old timers around here said those big ones sometimes attacked wagon trains or homesteads, <laughs> but nobody knows for sure. We do know that jackalopes roam together in groups of 10 to 20 individuals. Scientists call this kind of group a committee of jackalopes. <laughs> in the springtime, Helga continues her animated and impressively detailed lecture on the natural history of the jackalope, covering information about the creature's habitat, mating, Feeding, shelter, speed, camouflage, predation, herding, evolution, thermoregulation, recent sightings, and of course, threats to the species. Wrapping up her enthusiastic introduction to the imaginary animal we both love, she adds, but then you said you're a serious jackalope researcher, Mike, so you must know all that. <laughs> the jackalope lady smiles at me, and I smile back. As a fellow jackalope aficionado, I recognize the twinkle in her eye. <laughs> a man comes through the back door and introduces himself as Bill, a native of Douglas who works, with Hel uh, who works with Helga at the visitor center. At that moment, I happen to be asking about Jackalope Days, a festival the town holds each year to celebrate its iconic mascot. Oh, we have a lot of fun, Helga says. Everybody comes out for it. Now Bill chimes in. 
I remember the very first one back in 84 when I was a kid. Was that the one where somebody got drunk and plowed down the big jackalope statue that had been out on the median of old Yellowstone Highway since the 60s, I asked, referring to the main road through town? Yeah, Bill says, chuckling. When our local deputy showed up, that fella climbed out of his pickup and swore that that big jackalope had jumped out in front of him. <laughs> he laughs again. What kind of responses do you get from visitors who don't already know about the jackalope, I ask? They love it, Helga says, especially the kids, but grown-ups too. I'd say about half of them leave believing they're real, and that's okay. My mind flashes to my writing desk at home in Reno, where I keep pens in a jackalope coffee mug emblazoned with the reassuring slogan, the important thing is that I believe in myself. <laughs> yep, people love them. I always ask visitors if they've seen any jackalopes on their drive in, and of course they've always seen jackrabbits, so I just tell them those are the jackalope does. <laughs> and then they point to these display mounts and ask me, are they real? And I say, yes, they are. And they are real, Mike. They're real jackalopes. Helga's answer has me smiling. Why do you think people love jackalopes, I ask. Helga, beaming, has a ready answer. Because they're as real as you want them to be. <laughs> and I just love that answer. And part of what was so fun about this project was everybody I interviewed from like, you know, cryptozoologists <laughs> and jackalope storytellers to world-class virologists and epidemiologists, everybody I interviewed, my final question was always, why do you think people love jackalopes? So over the arc of the book, you get this um, kind of buildup, this accretion of different kinds of answers to that question. And that's part of what was so fun for me to have all these really neat and lively interviewees kind of help me to tell the story. After I spoke with Helga uh, and went to leave, and I, she knew I was leaving Douglas, she handed me a sealed envelope and she said, the mayor would like me to give this to you as a gift um, on behalf of the people of Douglas. We think you're gonna need it. And I got out to my truck and opened the envelope and it was a jackalope hunting license. <laughs> now, this is a gag that's been going strong in Douglas, Wyoming since the 1940s. And by the way, the jackalope hunting license only empowers you to hunt jackalopes on June 31st. So uh, the logic is if you're gonna hunt an imaginary animal, I guess you should do it on a non-existent day. <laughs> But I had so much fun in Douglas um, and uh, I learned so much about why people are legitimately proud of the jackalope and how much fun they have with it. Um, part of what I like about the jackalope is that it can be created in so many ways. It's truly an imaginative character that belongs to all of us. So just by way of contrast, think of Disney characters. There are armies of intellectual property lawyers that are out there every day protecting those Disney characters. There have even been cases of kindergartens that painted Disney characters on their fence and got a cease and desist letter from Disney. <laughs> Nobody owns the jackalope. That's part of what's so special about it. If you wanna go home tonight and make up a story about a jackalope or write a song or make a painting, then you're helping the jackalope to move forward through the culture in time. <laughs> Nobody owns the jackalope. We are all part of its creation and its propagation in the culture. So for example, you might make, it, make a jackalope as an artist, or you might make a jackalope as a taxidermist, or you might make it digitally through Photoshop, right? There are lots of ways to create this. This is one of my very favorites. Some of you may recognize this famous bunny, maybe the most famous rabbit in all of world art history. It's Albrecht Durer's uh, watercolor called Young Hare from the very early 16th century. And some smart aleck just decided to Photoshop pronghorns onto it <laughs> and then said that the long lost Durer manuscripts had been rediscovered and it turns out that Durer was fascinated with jackalopes. <laughs> so I love this kind of stuff because again, nobody's gonna get sued for doing this. It's really fun uh, and there's really no limit to what you can do with it. Part of what I also love about the jackalope is unlike a lot of invented animals, which you know, you can sort of tell our hogwash right away. For me, the jackalope always inhabits this space in my mind where it feels imaginary and real at the same time. So I love an image like this 
because, you know, we look at that, we know better, right? There's a part of our brain that says that's obviously a hoax image, but it looks like it could exist. And that's different from many invented animals. Um, hybrid animals are very common in folklore and mythology. <laughs> There's something about the jackalope that looks credible. And I've met many, many people around the country who tell me their stories of, yeah, I, I used to think it was real. And here's how I finally found out. The other thing that's different about the jackalope from many other invented animals is many of those invented animals depend only on stories. The jackalope is always in conversation between the artifact and the narrative, between the thing and the story. So for example, if I tell you um, a story about jackalopes and you say, I don't know, I don't, that doesn't sound right, Mike. I don't think I can believe you. Well, I'll just march you down to the pool hall or the VFW lodge and go, there it is. How can you argue with that, right? <laughs> so the jackalope stays in the culture because these crazy stories about it and the images of it, including, of course, the taxidermy mounts, are always kind of in conversation with each other. Now, um, I am not personally that interested in taxidermy, but I knew that because the jackalope began as a taxidermy mount before all those postcards and aprons and oven mitts, it was the taxidermy mount that made the jackalope famous. I knew I was going to have to learn something about it. So I made a pilgrimage to visit the two most important, in my mind, two most important jackalope makers in the world. This is Frank English from Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, I had been told for years that he was the most prolific jackalope maker in the world. So I couldn't wait to see how he was cranking out all these jackalopes. So I drove out and I visited Frank and his wife, Diane, in suburban Rapid City, South Dakota. And we were sitting in his living room having a nice chat. And I figured when we were done, we'd jump in the truck and go out to some barn out on the prairie to see this huge operation. And instead he said, well, Mike, you wanna see where the magic happens? And he took me into his basement. In his basement of his suburban home in Rapid City, South Dakota, over the last 35 years, he and his wife have made over 200,000 oh. jackalope mounts. So you can tell from this picture, what Frank is all about is streamlining the process. And he's very ingenious. And part of what was hilarious about my interview with him was he was so proud of all these innovations he had created in jackalope making that he wanted to show me all of them, but he didn't want anybody else to learn about it. So every, every other sentence was, now I'm going to tell you how I do this, but you're not going to put it in your book. <laughs> so I made a promise to Frank that all this proprietary stuff would stay secret with me, and it has. But the bottom line is he is capable of producing jackalopes at an incredible rate. Then I went straight from South Dakota down to a, a little town on the edge of Casper, Wyoming, and I talked with Mike Herrick. Now, um, Douglas and Ralph Herrick were those two teenagers back in the day who had made that first jackalope. There are three generations of Herricks still making jackalopes in Wyoming. So Mike is the son of the man who invented the jackalope. And, you know, he was the opposite of Frank. He makes very few jackalopes each year. He does not care about the money. He is all about the craft. And he takes a lot of pride in this because his dad taught him to make, his dad who invented the jackalope taught him to make his first jackalope when he was about 12. He's been making them ever since and he makes them the way his dad taught him. And that family handcraft is what matters to him. And the way he put it to me was, my family gave something to the world. And it was so interesting because I had come into the project originally as a humor writer, like, oh, that jackalope's going to be really funny. I could have a great time with this. And it is funny. But here I was seeing this craftsman who didn't really see it as funny, who saw it as a family uh, tradition that he took a lot of pride in. And I learned a lot from that about the fact that there are many more dimensions to this story than just the humor side of it. Now, in the book, I talk about the fact that it started with those jackalope taxidermy mounts, but it turned into everything else you could imagine. But of all this kitsch, of all this kind of tacky junk that has been flowing out from the jackalope since the 1930s, the, the best known is postcards. So here I am on the right doing a little research with a vintage postcard. Here are some examples on the left. Jackalope postcards have existed since the 1940s. One of my interviews with the book is with this really funny obsessive guy in Utah who is the world's greatest collector of jackalope postcards. And as he started to trust me, he would say stuff to me on the phone like, don't tell my wife, but I've started to plan family vacations to go to places where I think I could get one more card. <laughs> so he, he's really into this, but jackalope cards have been around forever, right? And 
you know, some of them trade on iconic stuff from the American West, as you would expect. What you're seeing on the left is another bit of evidence of this point I'm making about the relationship between the artifact and the narrative, between the thing and the story. One of the great folk folkloric tales about the jackalope is, you know, why are jackalopes so rare? Because they only mate during lightning storms. <laughs> we don't know who started that story or how long it's been around, but obviously the person who made this postcard had heard the story. But once the postcard is made, and then it gets sent around, on the back it explains, this is an image of jackalopes mating in a lightning storm, which is why they're so rare. So there's, again, this conversation between the thing and the story. Now, jackalope postcards are still being made today. My book has a beautiful color insert of photographs, and this is one of the images that I've included. Um, Chet Phillips is a contemporary artist um, from Austin, Texas, and he's created a whole series of postcards with this particular little character. And this jackalope, it does nothing but fun stuff. You know, he plays the banjo, he paddle boards. You know, every time you see him, he's having a great time. But, you know, Chet knows that what he is producing is in a tradition that has been going on since the 1940s. And that's part of why he enjoys it. Raise your hand if you've been to Wall Drug in South Dakota. A few of you guys and many of the rest of you have heard of it. It's the greatest roadside junk shop in all of North America. It is so fun. And they have been selling jackalopes for at least 70 years. So I went to Wall Drug and I interviewed the family that owned the place. On the right, you're seeing you know, a, a wall of their mounts for sale. On the left, this is the big jackalope statue they have out back, where, by the way, at least once a summer, Somebody gets up there with his girlfriend and proposes marriage. Um, so <laughs> South Dakota, you know, they love their jackalopes there. So I had so much fun interviewing the family about their family's multi-generational relationship uh, with jackalopes. And uh, we, we've become fast friends. So now whenever Wall Drug gets a new jackalope t-shirt in, they mail it to my house. So every now and then I have the pleasure, even though my family has staged interventions already, you know, it's like, hey, another jackalope t-shirt. And my, my daughters are like, yeah, that's what you need, dad, another jackalope t-shirt. Here's one of my favorites, Jackalope University. I wear this on the principle that you should dress for the job you want to have. <laughs> But jackalope junk is everywhere out there, you know? So here's a ball cap, a, a, a coffee mug, a Christmas ornament. Um, you know, they, they've thought of just about everything. Here's a jackalope weather vane. And jackalopes get represented in very different ways. So here's a gnarly jackalope on the bottom of a skateboard. And contrast that with these cute little jackalopes. And by the way, at a few of my readings around the West, kids have shown up and they already have their jackal stuffed jackalope toys that they bring with them. Here's some jack a jackalope on some wearable art, which it often pops up in places like that. And when it comes to beer and whiskey and wine, oh my goodness, jackalopes are everywhere um, and more all the time. Um, and especially in cases where people are doing something interesting that involves hybridity because the jackalope is a combination of two different things. People who uh, make sausage or who make blends of wine, anything that has hybridity, the jackalope oftentimes becomes the kind of poster uh, child for it. In the book, I also look at jackalope in the arts, not just in the junk, but I look at jackalopes in visual art, in film, in music. And um, this is a wonderful Pixar animated short about a jackalope on the left. Here's a film for grownups on the right. One of the most fun interviews I did was with this crazy guy named Dave Watkins, who lives in the middle of the forest in central rural Georgia. And 40 hours a week by day, he works at his family's lumber yard. And on the weekends, he's an independent filmmaker and he's made a series of films about this murderous jackalope. <laughs> I think you can probably tell how low budget it is from the image you're looking at. Um, and you know, these, these films are so awful that they're just great. They're just wonderful. <laughs> and, and Dave knows that they're funny. He wants them to be funny, but they're incredibly gory and bloody. They're essentially <laughs> jackalope horror movies, but they're just intentionally so poorly done that they're really, really fun. Lots of books about jackalopes. Here's for kids on the left, young adults on the right. Um, this is a jackalope a collection of fiction on the right. So jackalopes pop up a lot in writing. Um, I discovered that just up the hill from us in uh, Nevada City is a really well-known cartoonist who back in the 80s had uh, two series of comic books, including this guy, 
who's kind of a smart aleck countercultural jackalope. He's kind of like a Bugs Bunny type, a trickster figure, very crafty. And here's the logical conclusion of all of this stuff. Um, I'm a humor writer, but I have never read anything as funny as this. My wife heard me laughing one day and said, what are you doing? And I said, oh my gosh, come here. You, you, gotta, you gotta see this. <laughs> so the point is that jackalopes are everywhere and that that original mount has inspired art in all of these different forms. Junk, yes, we all know about the junk, the t-shirts and the postcards, but also beautiful, beautiful art in many media. I did not caption this because I wondered if anybody recognizes where this giant winged jackalope mural is. Anybody know where this is? On the backside of Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> this is uh, in Mandalay Bay Casino in Vegas. Oh. And it's really quite beautiful. And you can tell the scale is huge. So I took this picture when I was doing some readings in libraries down there not too long ago. I want to show you just a couple of different examples of jackalope visual art to give you a sense of how different it can be depending on the imagination of its creator. Um, once you hand a creative person the idea of a horned rabbit, whether that person is a storyteller or a musician, a filmmaker, uh, or a visual artist, they can take it wherever they want to take it. So I'm going to just give, run, run through with you kind of a gallery of what I think are some pretty neat uh, images of visual art of the jackalope. So Michelle is an artist in, in Reno. I did a favor for her and she sent me this thank you card. It's actually quite small. And I just thought it was incredibly beautiful, kind of evocative of a sort of Winnie the Pooh aesthetic, right? But contrast an image like that with an image like this. Uh, Lily Jones is by trade a science illustrator. She illustrates science textbooks, but she decided she wanted to take that suite of skills and apply it to something imaginary. So she's done this piece so that it looks like an old piece of parchment from an old natural history text, right? And the fact that different parts of the anatomy are being identified and that we have this old script, I mean, part of your brain tells you you're seeing a legitimate old scientific description of an animal, right? So that aesthetic kind of triggers for you a whole different way of thinking about a jackalope. Then you get something like this. <laughs> Rob Osborne has created a 200-foot tall fire-breathing jackalope that attacks cities, and his aesthetic is borrowed from uh, Japanese monster movie posters from back in the day. But the point is, you know, nobody says that that can't be a jackalope, right? That's what he wants his jackalope to be. This was a very interesting story. I got an email from this guy, Bill Nelson, one day. He said, hey, I'm an artist in Denver. I'm doing an assemblage piece. That's where you put different stuff together to create a piece of art. He said, I'm doing an assemblage piece on commission for a client and I wanna use a jackalope in it, but I want it to be really special. And you don't know me, but I know that you're the jackalope guy. Would you have any suggestions for me? So I connected Bill with Mike Herrick, the son of the jackalope's inventor, the man whose work I had seen out on the edge of Casper, Wyoming. And what they agreed was that Mike would make Bill a jackalope using only the materials and techniques that would have been available to his dad in the 1930s. And so in effect, he created this beautiful brand new jackalope that is completely vintage. So for example, instead of having foam inside it, it has wood and it's all hand carved. So it was really a neat idea. And when I launched the book in March at the, in the theater at the Nevada Museum of Art, Bill actually flew out from Denver just for that day. So that was kind of neat. Rena is a public school teacher in Reno and she was a student of mine at UNR. My wife, Erin, who's here knew that Rena was an artist and commissioned this watercolor for me for my birthday some years ago. And this has been hanging above my writing desk while I was working on this book. And I just love how the animal looks so anatomically accurate, right? For those of us who know jackrabbits, it really looks right. And yet here it is sort of flying through space or through some imaginary uh, space. And this has always just to me been a very beautiful image. This woman grew up in the Caribbean, uh, is from Canada and paints in Paris. And when I interviewed her, uh, this was quite incredible. She makes a whole series of these paintings that are made with pigmented beeswax. So what you're seeing there is made entirely with beeswax and they're huge. Some of them are, you know, feet by feet, and they're all created uh, out of beeswax. Now, when I interviewed her about jackalopes, 
she actually was not even familiar with the American jackalope tradition because culturally she had come from elsewhere. She said, I just wanted my rabbits to have horns because, or antlers. And then she went into all of this aesthetic stuff about how the antlers could be put in relationship with the ears and how she could use costuming and colors and all that. And again, it opened up another dimension for me. Here's a person doing beautiful things with horned rabbits who's not even familiar with our tradition of the jackalope. Jackalope makes its way into politics occasionally too. Some of you might remember the hope slogan from Barack Obama's campaign. This smart alley guy in Florida decided to just turn hope into lope. So you will see these around occasionally. And this is not an animal that most of us would look at and say, oh yeah, it's a jackalope. But I include it here for you and also in the book to make the point, right? that you can take this idea of the horned rabbit as far as your imagination will let you. And here in Hannah Yada's beautiful work, uh, we have a horned rabbit that feels like it's somehow very primitive and yet also very futuristic, and in many ways is a cousin of the jackalope without quite evoking it. I uh, made a publicly available Spotify playlist of about 100 jackalope songs, and they range every genre from bluegrass to heavy metal and everything in between. And I was fascinated with the fact that songwriters also seem to be taken with jackalope. So these guys actually are Grammy winners. And I had a wonderful chance to interview Joe, the guy on the left, about a song that these guys put together called Jackalope that they also did a video for that's literally been screened millions of times. It's, they, they write for children and families and people love them, but also love this jackalope. And so, you know, I asked Joe what I asked everybody else. Why do you think people love jackalopes? And his answer was so interesting. He said, I think the hybridity of a jackalope really suggests what happens when we take different kinds of cultural traditions and put them together. And he said, isn't that a great image for who we are as a nation? That we've brought in people from different places with different traditions and mashed them together and made these weird things that didn't exist before. Now, you can agree with that or not, but I found it fascinating just because it was such a different answer to the question. And each person I asked had a take on the jackalopes, um, why the jackalope is beloved, that maybe I couldn't have gotten to on my own. This is just for fun. You can see on the right, you know, the alien, the unicorn, and Sasquatch riding on the jackalope. Um, but cryptozoologists do occasionally include the jackalope. Um, and this is a really fun world that I just barely dipped the toe into. I won't take you down this path too far. I interviewed this guy, Lauren Coleman, who runs the International Cryptozoology Museum. And by the way, cryptozoology, you know, we think of kind of Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster, and that's sort of part of it, the nutty stuff. But also cryptozoology, it's the, it's the actual scientific study of animals that might exist. So for example, a cryptozoologist uh, might study the ivory-billed woodpecker. Is it extinct or does it exist? Um, or for example, this is an image of a coelacanth, a lobe-finned fish that we were sure had been extinct for 44 million years. We knew it only from the fossil record until one day a fisherman caught one. And since then we've discovered many more. So cryptozoology can be, be very weird and wild and crazy, but it also involves the study of unusual animals that may or may not exist. I mentioned that only not, not to argue for the jackalope's existence, but to say, you know, in a world where we have narwhals and hummingbirds and stingrays with 10 foot discs, the world is full of magical things that if we didn't know they existed, we wouldn't believe it, right? And I like putting that in relationship uh, with the jackalope. Now, one thing I didn't know anything about when I started the project is I was just proud of our iconic jackalope here in the American <laughs> West. I've always thought it was hilarious and celebrated it. But I got into this project further and I said to myself, well, you know, is the jackalope actually unique or might there be horned rabbits in other cultures? And I spent a bunch of time researching this and it turns out to my surprise, there are horned rabbits in the folklore and mythology of cultures from around the world indigenous cultures in Mexico and in the Americas. Um, many African peoples have folkloric stories about horned rabbits, almost every nation in Europe at one point or another. Um, and 
in the in Asia, so in Japan, China, and Korea, rabbits are often considered very important spiritually. So, for example, we have the man in the moon, right? When we look at the moon and see that ambiguous shape, we say that we see the face of a man. Uh, it's the lunar hair. It's, it's the hair in the moon, the rabbit in the moon, in all those other cultures. And rabbits are very important to them. I've even found ancient Buddhist texts going back thousands of years in which Buddha himself uses the horned rabbit as a teaching tool. So it turns out that the jackalope is one of many horned rabbits from around the world. This is the oldest image of a horned rabbit, and there's a whole story that goes with it. This is emerging from a 13th century natural history from the Arabic world. Um, and so that's how far back we can go, thousands of years, to find horned rabbits in other cultures. Um, through the late medieval and Renaissance periods, horned rabbits were so common in natural history texts and also in art that in fact they got a species name. So you probably can't make it out, but above these little horned rabbits, it says Lepus cornutus, just like we're Homo sapiens, right? And Lepus cornutus means the rabbit with the crown. And Lepus cornutus appeared, the, 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 the term Lepus cornutus exists in French and Italian and Dutch and German and Spanish. All of those cultures had a version of this uh, during the Renaissance. Here, another page from a natural history manuscript. Here, we're jumping up to the 16th century. You know, here's one species of rabbit, here's another, here's a fox. Oh, and by the way, here's another species of rabbit, the rabbit with the antlers, right? Lepus cornutus. Even in art from this period, and here we're looking at, first of all, a painting by the great Renaissance masters, um, Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubens, and it was the most important topic of a Renaissance painting, the Madonna and Child, and yet you can't make it out. If you look at the image uh, in my book, you'll see the horned rabbit down here. So once I started looking, these horned rabbits were just appearing everywhere in literature, in art, and in natural history. So here we're, we're jumping all the way up into the 19th century when science was pretty sophisticated. And again, a page of a natural history manuscript indicating different species of rabbit. And there we have uh, Lepus cornutus. This happens to be in French, Le Livre Cornu. <coughs> so this guy was everywhere. And I sort of include this just for fun. This is a whiskey that I really like. Um, it's called Burai, and it's called Burai because it's half bourbon and half rye. And when the distillers decided to create this hybrid, they said, what would be a great image for a hybrid whiskey? The jackalope, because it's hybrid. And in fact, as you can see, they've chosen to represent this with a, a historical natural history illustration of the horned rabbit. I'm going to just give you one example. I've said that these horned rabbits are in cultures from around the world. I have found at least four different horned rabbits in Germany alone. They travel under different names, the Rasselbach, the Hasselbach, the Wolpertinger. They come from different regions of the country. They have slightly different traditions. My favorite is this guy, the Wolpertinger. It's a horned rabbit that also has the wings of a, of a quail or a pheasant occasionally. Um, and this is how serious this guy is from Bavaria, from the heavily forested part of Germany. And so I interviewed some Bavarians about the Wolpertinger. And it was hilarious. It was so fun. They said, oh, yeah, this is, this is a really important part of our culture. You know, we have a certain day of the year where nobody goes to school or work. We do nothing but celebrate the Wolpertinger. You know, we crown a Miss Wolpertinger. And you know, the kids all dress up like Wolpertingers. I mean, they were really, really into this. And they told me all these stories about <laughs> Wolpertingers, including the traditional, traditional Wolpertinger hunt. Now, as I've traveled around, many people have told me jackalope hunting stories. And often it's some version of, oh man, when I was 15, my grandfather took me out and said we were gonna go jackalope hunting and here's how it went and here's how long it took me to figure out what was going on. Um, so in Bavaria, they have, a really ritualized, really traditional rite of passage. It's the Wolpertinger hunt. This is a, a forest culture, a hunting culture. When kids get to be about 14, 15 years old, the elders in the, in the village will come to them and say, okay, it's your turn now to become one of us. We've all captured a Wolpertinger. You have it, now it's your turn. We're gonna help you, but it's your turn to show your bravery and do this, right? And with these kinds of gags, there's always lots of props. Oh, you have to have this special Wolpertinger stick. 
and you have to have you can't use a regular bag you have to have a special Wolpertinger sack and all this stuff right so they march this kid out in the dark into the forest on a moonlit night and they plant him in a clearing in the forest and they say okay now you stay here with your stick and your your sack we're all going to go out into the forest and drive the Wolpertingers toward you so this kid stands out in the field and of course, they all go back to the hunting lodge and drink, right? <laughs> and the whole gag is, how long will it take this kid standing alone in a field in the forest to realize that something is, is amiss? Then they will go back to the hunting lodge. And far from being you know, criticized or made fun of, they're welcomed. And they're hugged. And rounds are bought. And now that kid has made a transition from the people who don't know to the people who do. They've joined that community. And they will help that community to perform this ritual for the next person. Um, I had so much fun talking to them. I will say this, this uh, curator who I spoke with in Bavaria, she was so polite and so friendly. And the one moment where she really slipped and was super direct was uh, I said, you know, do you think Bavarians know about the jackalope, the American jackalope? And she said, oh, you know, who would care about that Johnny come lately? You know, <laughs> We've had the Wolpertinger for centuries. You know, it's the same old, like, oh, you Americans who just steal stuff from us. Because they've had Wolpertinger stories for hundreds of years, and their Wolpertinger taxidermy mounts go back to the 18th century. So they've been doing this a long time. This was kind of fun. Um, uh, Kate O'Hara is a local artist in Reno, and this is a beer from Great Basin Brewery that came out about six months ago. And when I saw this on the can, and I, I do some work with Great Basin, I thought, this is wonderful. I have to interview the artist. So I got a hold of Kate and said, where did you get the inspiration to create a beer label with a Wolpertinger? And she said, a what? <laughs> and so I sent her that image on the right and she couldn't believe it. She said, I just wanted my jackalope to be able to fly. That was what she said to me. So the point is, again, the jackalope is a product of the imagination and it can be taken anywhere you want to take it. Now for the big pivot. I will let you absorb this grotesque image for a minute before I explain to you what you're looking at. So, having spent half the book talking about all of the imagination and folklore and mythology that goes into the American jackalope, I then reveal to you that horned rabbits actually exist in nature. Sometimes they look like this, where they have growths on their face. But you can see how this might be subject, suggestive of a jackalope when you see an image like this. Sometimes these horns are actually quite tall on the head. They can be very black. It's never going to look as stylized as a jackalope, but certainly it is a horned rabbit. And that's the term that hunters have long used for these animals. Every mammal, many birds and fish and reptiles and amphibians, but every mammal is stricken by a papillomavirus that is specific to that species. Papillomaviruses are among the oldest living things on Earth. They came far before we did, and they co-evolved with each species. So if you've ever heard of human papillomavirus, that's the papillomavirus that we co-evolved with, HPV. This is a papillomavirus called Shelf papillomavirus, and it's specific to rabbits. I'm going to learn in a minute why it's called Shelf papillomavirus. I did a lot of work with these scientists at uh, University of Kansas because they have the world's greatest museum collection of, uh, of these rabbits that are stricken with this virus, which is really important because those specimens were collected over 150 years in all different places and careful records kept long before we knew we would ever have DNA testing. Now we can DNA test these rabbits and we're learning a lot about how widespread this rabbit virus is. And we're learning a lot about the distribution of rabbits that are stricken by this virus. I don't make this claim in the book because it would be too hard to anchor, but I will share with you that the more we learn about the, the, the geographical distribution of rabbits stricken with uh, show papillomavirus, the more that map looks like an overlap with the map of cultures whose folklore and mythology include horned rabbits. So in other words, there's probably a relationship between observations of these animals in the wild and stories that are told about them. Now, um, I want to make the point that the first hoax mount was made by the Herrick brothers in Wyoming in the 1930s. We know that. 
But naturalists, including very prominent naturalists in the United States, long before that, were already making observations of these actual horned rabbits in nature. There's no evidence that the Herrick brothers knew about these, um, but it is interesting that we have these two stories unfolding at the same time, that we have actual horned rabbits in the natural world being observed, and we have this proliferation of jackalope stuff that's kind of running parallel to it. Now, I wanted to figure out who was the first person who ever scientifically took an interest in these horned rabbits, and what was that story? <clears throat> so it turns out that this guy, Richard Shobe, was the first scientist ever to work on horned rabbits. Now, he was from Iowa, but he had become a world-famous virologist. During the COVID, we all heard about the 1918 pandemic, in which between 50 and 100 million people died globally. This is the guy who figured out what caused that pandemic. It took him 18 years, and by then nobody was paying attention, but he ended up at the Rockefeller Institute in Princeton because he had made that incredible breakthrough. And he kept hearing these stories from his friends who were hunters back in Iowa. Yeah, every now and then we shoot a rabbit, has these weird growths. And he said, well, start sending them to me and tell everybody else to do the same. So hunters across the Midwest, whenever they shot a rabbit that ended up having those weird growths, the word was out, send it to Princeton because this guy wants to look at it. There's no co connection between these two things, but I love this idea that I know from reading scientific papers in the 30s that 1932 was the year that Shope began studying horned rabbits. 1932 was also the year that the Herrick brothers said they made their first jackalope hoax mount. <laughs> I love that idea, right? That there's this fork in the road that actual horned rabbits in nature are gonna lead toward these incredible scientific breakthroughs. And at exactly the same moment, a couple of smart aleck kids out on the prairie invent this joke it is going to become the world's most famous and profitable taxidermy hoax ever. So I started reading all these scientific papers from the 30s and digging around in archives, but I was having trouble putting together the whole story of what this guy had accomplished. I mentioned that I do a lot of interviewing in the book. I managed to track down Richard Schultz's two surviving children who were both in their mid to late 80s. And we talked and talked and talked, and I learned so much about their dad, and we became close friends. And eventually they shared with me all of these unpublished letters and journals and photographs from their father. And that was what finally allowed me to put together the whole story of how Shope had worked on these rabbits. And as I'm about to tell you, his work led to some incredible stuff. In fact, when I've been traveling around the West doing readings, it's not uncommon occasionally for somebody to raise their hand and say, I'm here because that guy was my great grandfather. I'm here because he was my great grand uncle. So the Shope family is thrilled because this story of what Richard Shope accomplished has finally been told in a chapter of my book. And it was really, really fun uh, to do that work. Now, if you connect the dots, and I'm going to leave out a lot of nerdy science stuff, but just ask you to follow me on one nerdy science thing that'll be helpful to you. When Shope was doing his work in the 1930s, the scientific community was unanimous that a virus could not cause cancer in a mammal. The take was, you know, cancer is not contagious. That doesn't make any sense, right? Richard Shope's work on horned rabbits proved that those horns are caused by a virus, first of all, and the way he did it is brilliant. I described it in the book. And secondly, that those were often carcinomas, that they were cancerous and that they often killed the animal. We now know that about 10% of global cancer deaths each year are caused by viruses. So this is a huge breakthrough. After Shope's death, other scientists pick up his work, win the Nobel Prize in medicine on their way to the development of the human papillomavirus vaccine. The HPV vaccine, which is the safest, most effective anti-cancer vaccine we've ever created, literally would not exist without horned rabbits. So we have this amazing story where we start with, you know, the the stuffed jackalope over the pool table, you know, and we end up with literally millions of lives being saved every year with a vaccine that emerged from the study of horned rabbits. Now, I'm only going to show you one slide like this because I'm a storyteller and these kinds of slides don't tell a story. Um, but I want to just give you a quick rundown. HPV is very, very common. Most of us will have it at some point in our lives and not know. It's usually benign but it can cause a variety of different kinds of cancers. 
And the HPV vaccine is incredibly uh, safe and effective. So there's still 350,000 people dying of cervical cancer every year, which is a disease caused almost exclusively by HPV, more than 99% of the time. Um, and there are some reasons why there's been a lot of confusion and misinformation about this vaccine. Now, as a science writer, part of my job is to turn data into narrative, to turn statistics into story. I have to find a way to humanize and personalize my topics and not just give you a lecture with a bunch of slides like this, which, you know, no matter how much you care, are still likely to make you glaze over. So what I want to do is just give you a quick example from the book of how I try to take stuff like this and turn it into stories that are accessible and meaningful to people and that help to make clear what the stakes are. So this is sort of the pivot in my story of the horned rabbit. So let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> My friend Catherine Bishop's stepsister, Julie Forward DeMay, was diagnosed with stage 1B cervical cancer in January 2008. The following month, she underwent a radical hysterectomy in an attempt to remove the cancer. Despite the surgery, the cancer metastasized, spreading to her chest wall and lung. Julie's disease was now diagnosed as 4B, the most serious stage of cervical cancer. Because Julie had been 34 years old in 2006, when the HPV vaccine became available, she was just outside the age range for which it was then approved, and so did not have the option of protecting herself through vaccination. When she learned of my book project, Catherine gave me a rare gift, the journal Julie had kept between New Year's Day 2009 and her death eight months later on August 10th. Julie's family posthumously published this document as the book Cell War Notebooks. Julie's journal is a remarkable and moving record of how the mind and heart respond to an impossible situation in which the fate of the body can no longer be controlled. Cell War Notebooks is punctuated by moments that are unbearably moving. How Julie feels when she's no longer able to help her five-year-old daughter, Luca, do something as simple as pull on her tights. What it means to contemplate marriage vows exchanged with her husband, Scott, when neither of them could have imagined what loving in sickness and in health would actually mean when sickness becomes unbearably destructive or even how it feels to lose your hair, as when Julie writes that being bald is the cancer signal. And from here on out, I won't be so incognito with my ugly mutating cells. People will see my pretty scarf and know that I am sick. Catherine also suggested that I talk with Julie's mother, Jane Forward, who generously agreed to share her experience with me in a conversation. Julie was a very free spirit, Jane told me, her voice soft with affection. She was very feisty. Julie had studied creative writing at Colorado State, and after graduation, had lit out for new adventures in Portland, where at the time she knew no one. When she met Scott, they fell in love, and they had a wedding on the beach. It was idyllic, and for two years, everything was wonderful. And then, boom, everything that could go wrong did. After Julie's initial diagnosis and hysterectomy, the family was hopeful. She got better, and then she had that summer when she was doing really well, and we got together and rented a house on a lake and had a great time. Then, the day before Christmas, she went to the emergency room and found out it was back. We had thought we were out of the woods because the surgeon had looked right at us and said she had gotten all the cancer, but she hadn't. Did you know about the link between HPV and cervical cancer before it touched your family? I asked Jane. I didn't have the slightest idea about HPV until Julie was diagnosed, she replied. Jane went on to explain that she's now learned much more about HPV. The incidence of throat cancers in men has gone way up. And that's something a lot of people don't realize. It's not just cervical cancer. It's many kinds of cancers that are caused by HPV. People think the vaccine's just for women, but it really isn't. As Jane and I continued to talk, I had the pleasure of learning more about Julie 
whose voice in her journal had captivated me. How vivacious she was, her creative work as a writer and photographer, her deep love for her family and friends. I also learned more about Luca, who was just six years old when her mom died. Jane's, <clears throat> Jane's pride as a grandmother came through when she told me that Luca had just graduated from high school and would be headed to the University of Oregon in the fall. <clears throat> As we wrapped up our conversation, I asked Jane if there was anything more she wanted to add. The only thing I want to say is that Julie was determined to beat it. She was just absolutely determined. And so when she was told there wasn't anything more they could do for her, that was a pretty rough time. It was about a month before she died when they told her that. That was a rough time for all of us. For the first time during our conversation, Jane's voice sounded unsteady. <clears throat> Jane's moving story reminded me of the courageous passage that concludes Cell War Notebooks, the final words Julie was able to record in her journal. It's just time to let go of the pain. It's time to teach my daughter the beauty and strength in surrender. It's time to show her the absolute courage it takes to fight with all the power you have and then realize the pain is not going to stop. And when the pain is gone, I can hear endless belly laughs on the porch and pretty music in the far off distance. <clears throat> so I mentioned that I do a lot of interviews in the book and you can imagine the ethical responsibility of a writer when they have those kinds of stories shared with them. So this was a story the family wanted told in the interest of helping to educate and inform other people in hopes that their family would not suffer the same kind of loss. <clears throat> now, I hope you're totally bummed out. I hope you're all sad and crying because that's part of my job as a writer, but I would never leave you that way. So we're gonna pivot to something really fun to finish up with. Uh, I was, I thought, done with the manuscript of this book. And then it occurred to me one day, I've been all over the country, I've interviewed all these people, I've done all this archival research, but the one stone I had left unturned was that I had not tried to make a jackalope myself. <clears throat> now, I was not particularly interested in making a jackalope, but I knew I had to do it as a writer. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna find somebody who can teach me how to make a jackalope taxidermy mount. I'm sure I'll be headed back out to <laughs> Wyoming or South Dakota. The only place in America where I could find a jackalope making workshop was in the Mission District of San Francisco. <laughs> so I spent quite a bit of time and a ridiculous amount of money in a jackalope making workshop with these hipsters in San Francisco, <clears throat> which was a pretty crazy experience. As a humor writer, it was, it, it was such a gift. It was just low hanging fruit because the whole day was so funny and strange. And I was a really terrible jackalope maker. And that was part of what made it so fun. I mean, I'm a teacher. I like to think that I'm very patient and encouraging with my students. The guy who taught this course, he was all day, Mike, you're the worst. You're just the worst ever. I want to be clear, not just today, ever. You're the worst at this ever. And he's kind of shooing me out of my seat and trying to repair all the damage I had created to my jackalope. So anyway, I was quite awful at this. So here's this place, Paxton Gate in the Mission District of San Francisco. Very strange place. This is what, this is me taking a picture of it from the outside. That's kind of what it looks like on the inside. It couldn't be stranger. And in the back of this place, they have a little shop where they take about 10 people at a time and they do these strange workshops. So I went there, went there by myself and I just kind of met the other people who were there by themselves. This is James and Dave. I just met them. We spent all day together. <clears throat> they were both on their own too. Everybody had a different reason for being there. Many of the reasons were very strange. Um, so it turns out it's A, super gross to make a jackalope, which I should have anticipated, but it's also hard to do. And so I kept thinking back to somebody like Mike Herrick, a craftsman who could make something so beautiful and so precise and so individual um, as I kind of labored away at my lousy jackalope. Now, when I was done, my jackalope was so awful. I had named him Paxton after the place. <clears throat> I mean, he was just terrible. 
His ears wouldn't stand up, so they're stapled together with cardboard. His eyeballs kept falling out. His face is all held together with these craft pins, and he wouldn't sit up straight. I mean, everything was wrong with him. So I come home from San Francisco, and I know that since the last chapter of the book is this very funny story of me making this terrible jackalope, that I'd like to have a picture of the jackalope in my book. So I go to the university and uh, talk to a professional photographer there who I work with sometimes, and I said, hey, Kyle, you know, I need a high resolution image of my crappy jackalope for the book. <clears throat> he said, no problem. And then he came back with this glam shot. <laughs> and I said, dude, you didn't even read the book. I mean, the whole point is how terrible he is. And you've made him look great. What did you do? And he's very shy. And he said, well, you know, I brushed his fur for an hour. And, you know, I used a Use the lighting scheme I use when I shoot debutantes. And, you know, I photoshopped him afterwards. So anyway, this, there's a full page glossy image of this beautiful jackalope in my book, even though he actually looked a lot more like the jackalope on the left. <clears throat> so I want to close with you guys this evening by reading you just a couple pages of this funny adventure that I had in San Francisco making this terrible jackalope. It was kind of the capstone experience of my long journey on this project. And so it'll make a nice place to end the evening with you guys too. So this is from the last chapter, which is called The Jackalope Maker. After nearly seven hours of bunny crafting, I continued to feel self-conscious about how poorly my jackalope had shaped up. But I noticed that over at the other table, the hipster woman's creation had fared even worse. <laughs> Unlike me, however, she was creative enough to regard every mistake as an opportunity. For example, when she cut through her rabbit skin on its cheek where the error could never be hidden, she immediately turned the hole into a second eye. <laughs> so her jackalope looked like a rabbit from the right side and a double-eyed rabbit flounder from the left. <laughs> then she doubled down on her jack of flounderlope by purchasing from the store a pair of dried turkey claws mounted on spikes. Without hesitation, the woman drove them into her animal's foam belly, thus producing a rabbit with horns, two eyes on one side of its head, and giant scaly outstretched talons. He's radioactive, she declared, expressing just the kind of delight a jackalope maker should always take in their work. <laughs> As I now step back to appraise what I had created over the course of a full day, my jackalope, whom I had named Paxton, seemed the perfect embodiment of my failure as a rookie craftsman. With his crooked face and flaccid ear and asymmetrical antlers, his face full of numberless yellow-headed craft pins, and even I now observed for the first time his slightly crossed eyes, <laughs> He appeared not so much poorly crafted as decidedly annoyed. I confess that his aggravated appearance charmed me. As, and as he glared back at me with a look of genuine exasperation, I began for the first time that day to laugh. Well, Paxton, you're absolutely right, I said aloud. I sure messed you up. I could almost see him rolling his crossed eyes as I imagined his reply. Of all the guys in the world who could have made me, I get this guy. <laughs> a man working at the shop kindly gave me an old cardboard box in which to transport my jackalope such as he was as I prepared to walk across San Francisco. I placed Paxton carefully into the box, folded shut its flaps and tucked the box under my arm. Before leaving the store, I asked the guy if the jackalope making class was popular. Oh, for sure, our most popular, fills up every time. Why do you think people love jackalopes? It's cool in a weird way, or maybe weird in a cool way. I don't know, but I've seen lots of different kinds of people in this class. Young, old, white, black, teachers, hunters, artists. Probably different people have their own reasons for loving jackalopes. All I can say for sure is that they do. I stepped beneath the arching neck of the giraffe and out into the low angled afternoon light that poured into the city from across the Pacific. Walking through the mission, I experienced a deep sense of satisfaction. What passerby could ever guess the marvelous treasure concealed in my nondescript box? <laughs> Thank you.
ending of the book, but that gets pretty close. And I'll just mention that this is my Nevada trilogy, my last three books, Raising Wild, Rants from the Hill, and How to Cuss in Western. There's my daughters helping me to launch this book. And I can't thank you guys enough for making time to support this institution and taking pride in what we do here in Nevada. I always love doing events with uh, people here in uh, my hometown and close to it. And uh, I will be happy to stick around and inscribe books or just chat with you, hear your jackalope sighting stories, whatever you would like. But thanks again very much for being with us.